To help break all of this down, we're joined by Eric Mandel, the director of the Middle East Political Information Network, and Jonathan Schenzer, senior vice president for research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Welcome to you both. Um, Ulmer there calling Netanyahu a loser. Yoav Borovitz, our correspondent in Tel Aviv, told us that he feels as if Netanyahu is getting weaker by the day. But I want to talk about the real losers. Let's start by talking about Israel's opposition. Because first, they failed in the April election. Second, yesterday, in the Israeli parliament, they vote, uh, they failed in, in the vote um, of the Knesset to dissolve itself. Why is Israel's opposition so toothless? Do, do you think they have a better chance at the September vote? Well, if you're a political junkie, this whole thing going on a second time is a lot of fun. But if you're an Israeli and you're an American who cares about Israeli national security interests, none of this is good. Uh, so who are the winners and the losers? Uh, Bibi would be considered a loser. Possibly the ultra-Orthodox and the peace plan would be a loser. So who are the winners? Blue and white gets a second chance if they stay together. Liebman is obviously another winner. And Aftali Bennett and Ayala Chaked have another chance to come back. But if Bibi is so obsessed and focused on Lieberman and things change, he will be portrayed as the defender of the ultra-Orthodox, which is not a popular position in the country. And all of a sudden, he makes Lieberman the defender of democracy, pluralism, and the person against the ultra-Orthodox. Well, Jonathan, I want to bring you in here. I mean, ultimately, forming a coalition government falls on Netanyahu, doesn't it? I mean, he was given ample time to make his case to sway the parties in, in the Knesset, and he just didn't get it done. Shouldn't Netanyahu be pointing the finger at himself? Well, look, this is certainly on Netanyahu's shoulders, although you cannot, uh, you, 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 you have to address the, the elephant in the room here, which is that uh, Lieberman has decided to just take out a knife and stick it right in and then twist it. I mean, he really wanted to give it to Netanyahu. He's allowed this feud of his with Netanyahu to go public and to impact the entire Israeli public as well. So I put a lot of this at Lieberman's feet, but certainly Netanyahu had the numbers. He had the mandate. He should have been able to convert it. Uh, and so he's going to be interim prime minister again for another hundred something days. And Jonathan, to your point, do, do you think that Liberman had it all planned as if the draft bill was just an excuse for him and he wasn't planning on forming a, a government with Netanyahu as Netanyahu claimed in the first place? Well, look, uh, you when you look at, at, at his uh, rhetoric, he was really more concerned about Gaza and Bibi's inability to get into the Gaza Strip and to put ground forces in there. Things changed, obviously, once he held all the cards in terms of coalition formation. Sure. It'll be interesting to see what his positions are moving forward during this campaign. All right, gentlemen, hold tight. We have a lot more to discuss with both of you. Too bad what happened in Israel. It looked like a total win for Netanyahu, who's a great guy. He's a great guy. And now they're back in the debate stage and they're back in the election stage. That is too bad because they don't need this. I mean, they've got enough turmoil over there. It's a, pl it's a tough place. I feel very badly about that. Uh, it looks like they're talking, but more likely they'll have to go back into election mode. That's too bad. Well, let's turn back to our panel. Eric Mandel is the director of the Middle East Political Information Network and Jonathan Shanzer, senior vice president of research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Uh, Jonathan, I'll start with you this time. Both Netanyahu and President Trump are signaling the peace plan will move forward despite the uncertainty of a new election in Israel. Should the plan wait or is rolling it out in June no matter what the right thing to do? I think it really has to wait. I think, well, there are parts of it that I think can move forward. Certainly this conference in Bahrain, uh, getting regional actors on board, I think is a wise thing to do and would give uh, all parties an opportunity to begin to digest the economic parts of all of this. But putting this out there in the middle of, a, of yet another election cycle and making a two-state solution or whatever combination they have uh, in mind for peace, uh, putting that on the table for the Israeli electorate to debate amidst all the other political turmoil seems to me a very bad idea. And the last thing that we want here in the United <laughs> States is to give the impression that we're trying to influence uh, the Israeli electorate as they go into elections again. Eric, do you agree? Should the White House consider to postpone the second phase, the political phase of the deal of the century. But, you know, the time frame is also very complicated. How big of a setback is it given the 2020 campaign in this country? 
Well, I think the Trump administration has to have a plan B. What happens if Bibi Netanyahu is not there going forward? I like the BBB. B, B. B, B, B. Uh, the uh, economic part should come out. There's no reason for it not to come out. The Palestinians are not going to be interested no matter what. Um, but I think that part should come out. It's very interesting in theory. If an American plan or American framework did come out during an Israeli election, the Israelis never really have debated a lot of these issues in, in such a way and to see where the politicos really fall if this is related to a two-state or something less, as, as, as Jitzhak Rabin once said, something less than two states mm -hmm. or less than a state. Well, in Netanyahu's remarks today, though, he showed a map that he says was given to him by Jared Kushner uh, showing the Golan Heights as a sovereign part of Israel, something that the Palestinians are totally against. I mean, is he, by showing that map, kind of fueling uh, the, the, the fodder for the Palestinians to be firmly against the plan even more before it's even rolled out? Well, Golan Heights is really Syrian, and yeah. there's actually a stronger case to be made that that from Syria, even though Syria is Humpty Dumpty and that's broken down, sure. that th that that was somebody else's territory, and it's a little higher uh, to climb. But the Palestinian territories, Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, whatever we're going to use, really has never had a stakeholder, and that really is open to debate. And remember, this is really about Israeli's secure boundaries. What are they? And to the Palestinians, they don't want anything of Israel over the Green Line, the 67 line. And to, unfortunately, too often to their rhetoric, they want all of Israel. But Israel has to think of for the future. If there's not a Jordan and that falls, if Iraq becomes a true Iran puppet, um, if to the north we have Syria and the Iranians and the popular mobilization units, Israel has to think about defensible borders and not wor worry about what the Palestinians say regarding territorial compromise because they've been offered territorial compromise and they have chosen not to accept it. Jonathan, uh, by showing this map in his speech today from Jerusalem, President Trump already mentioned, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, excuse me, already mentioned President Trump. And we just heard how President Trump called Netanyahu a great guy. And this comes after we're learning that both President Trump and President Putin were somewhat involved in the coalition talks in uh, Israel, the ones that have failed. Is that surprising or not really, given the high stakes involved in the Trump-Bibi alliance? Look, I, I think that what Bibi needs to do is to demonstrate that he's still a world leader. And I think that's one of the reasons why he held up that map, why he continues to tout the ties that he has to the White House and to other world leaders. He's trying to remind the Israeli public of the reason why he's been the number one vote getter for the last decade, and that is that he is a statesman, that he has the experience. And I think amidst all of this, this spat with Lieberman and, and all the, the upheaval and the questions about what happens next, he certainly looks weaker and he's trying to remind the public that he does have still some of these great strengths. Uh, and the other thing that I think to note here is that there's a possibility for the Israelis to engage not just in a peace process with the Palestinians, but also with the broader Arab world. That's sure. what's on the table, I think, in Bahrain, and it's been a context throughout all of this. And I think Bibi is trying to remind the rest of the Middle East as well that he is still very much plugged in uh, with the leadership here in Washington. But, but, Jonathan, the Bahrain workshop is really a big question mark here. There's a question of, of whether, you know, who's going to attend. Uh, we know the Palestinians have said they won't attend, even though many think that they should. We did hear from one Palestinian who says he will show up. Take a listen. We continue with negotiations regarding the peace accords because the Palestinian people will live quietly with its neighbors. We do not seek blood. Not according to our religion, we are forbidden to speak about this land. Not Trump, not America, and nobody in the land can sell Palestine. So, so Jonathan, are the Palestinians justified in opposing the peace plan at this stage? Look, I, I don't think they're justified because they don't know what's in it. In fact, none of us know what's in it. And, and that's been very frustrating for anyone who's trying to kind of uh, analyze or, or predict what's to happen next. But the Palestinians right now are more upset about the Trump administration's policies on other issues leading up to the peace process, whether it's Jerusalem, Golan Heights, uh, the closing of the embassy here uh, in Washington, the cutting of funding to the Palestinian Authority. So they're clearly unhappy. And this is the reason why you're seeing so few people attend, but the real opportunity is with the broader Arab world. Jonathan Shanzer, Eric Mandel, thank you both for being here on Crossroads. Pleasure.